Hello, everyone, and welcome to Scholars Hub at Home. I'm Kristen Wallace, the Director of uh, Communications and Marketing in the Division of Advancement here at York. Thank you for joining us for today's lecture, Unpacking and Understanding the Importance to a Land Acknowledgement. It is not just a script, with Dr. Ruth Green, Associate Professor and Special Advisor to the Dean's Office on Indigenous Issues, Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. Dr. Green will be joined today by Emma Poska, 
settler educator, educate, educator sorry, specializing in indigenization and decolonization. Emma is a PhD candidate in the School of Gender, Feminist and Sexuality Studies at York University. Emma is a settler educator focused on aligning themselves within the struggles that many Indigenous people face to end anti-Indigenous racism and gender-based violence that is perpetuated in the employment, academic, and legal and socio-political institutions and structures, which is the first step in decolonial work. Welcome, Emma. Thank you, Kristen. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land I am on. Because we are not gathered in the same place, the land I'm about to acknowledge might not be the territory you are on. Please take the responsibility to, to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As a settler, I identify as a first-generation Italian immigrant, straight, cisgender woman. Reading the land acknowledgement is significant to contextualizing Indigenous people in the present and ensuring that non-Indigenous people recognize the fact that we are on Indigenous lands. In my role as a settler educator, I take my lead from Indigenous people. My responsibilities are to dismantle the taken for granted assumptions of Canada while expanding on the negative impact and experiences of colonialism on Indigenous people, especially within the academy. Remember, if you need help with the Zoom webinar, please feel free to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and enter your question. Our team is ready to help you. The same button may be used to submit your questions for our guest speaker to answer the Q&A. Please note that all of your questions and comments are visible to our panelists and staff working behind the scenes. We ask that you keep your comments relevant and respectful. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Ruth Green. Dr. Green is a Haudenosaunee woman, Turtle Clan. She's an associate professor in the School of Social Work and is the Lapse Dean's advisor on Indigenous initiatives. We are pleased and honored to have you here today. Welcome, Professor Green. Hello, thank you, Emma. So, Sago, Skano, Ruth Nonyos, Hurushone Yogongwe, Ganagahaga, Nagawata Sota, Wakayata. What I've just told you in the Ganagahaga language is who I am. Uh, so, as Emma shared, I am from the Confederacy of the People that Build the Longhouses. I am from the Ganagahaga Nation or the People of the Flint and I am Turtle Clan, and those are parts of my responsibilities. Um, in this slide, I'm sharing and showing the Hiawatha Wampum, the Confederacy Wampum of the Haudenosaunee, or the people that build the longhouses. I also acknowledge that I have Celtic heritage. My father was a, a, a Celtic person, um, but both the Celtic hit, uh, lineages and the Horoshone lineages are counted through our mothers. So I acknowledge my Celtic father, but uh, identify as a Horoshone person. I am, uh, I always say um, my favorite word in the English language is uh, auntie because to my children, I am an Ista. Uh, being an Ista is very important to me and is a large part of how I approach this work. Uh, I always love to remind Indigenous people that they are their ancestors' best dreams and our descendants' greatest hopes. So I acknowledge my ancestors and the dreams that they had to fight for me to be here, and I work towards supporting the descendants of all people. Uh, I also identify as a queer 
uh, femme, and it is part of who I am and how I operationalize this world and the work I do. So, but why are we here? So we're here to have a bit of a conversation. I'm going to give a quick history of the land acknowledgement at York, uh, very specifically to York, because that's how we're all connected. Then we're going to discuss some of the wampum belts, uh, the dish with one spoon as spoken about in the land acknowledgement. And I'm going to share a very quick teaching on Gasventa or the two row wampum. We'll talk about how to make it personal. I'll provide you a few resources and then we'll have some question time. So here we go. Now, this is the original land acknowledgement. Land acknowledgements really came into an explosion of fashion and political um, knowledge shortly after the release of the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But many people had already been doing that, doing them. When we were asked, and we being the originally the Aboriginal Education Council for York University was asked to create a land acknowledgement. A few years earlier, the uh, Canadian Association of Universities Teachers released a document that more or less gave every university a very short uh, land acknowledgement to say. Well, that didn't feel as relevant to us. So we took the responsibility to craft one. And this was our first land acknowledgement in that I really do wanna acknowledge uh, the people that wrote this sitting in a room. Um, Deb, Dr. Deb McGregor, uh, Randy Pitawanaquit, myself, and Amy Darjolet. Uh, we spent lots of time talking about it, thinking about it, and uh, it was the first iteration. Land acknowledgements are not set in stone because it is a constant moving piece. But I wanna highlight two pieces in this that you'll see is are in all of the land acknowledgements. And these two phrases that I have highlighted in gray are ones that I always, that, that regularly, not always, regularly I hear altered. And I wanna share that these phrases were carefully picked. So in the original land acknowledgement, you see uh, the area known as Takaranto has been caretaken, caretaken, not taken care of. For me, when you take care of something versus when you are entrusted to be a care, like to take, taking care of, take, wow, I can't even conjugate today. Caretaken is more of a responsibility than taking care of, which feels almost like ownership. And so we do not own this territory. We are caretakers of it. And so for me, it's a distinction. So when people read it and say that the area known as Tacronto has been taken care of by it's not the truth. We are, it's been caretaken by. The second is the last line. This territory is subject to the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant. Now, we will talk about what that wampum actually means because people say this and have not, don't have a depth of understanding of that wampum. So I'm going to share a little teaching on that but it's an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lake regions. And I've read it or heard it say peacefully instead of peaceably. And these distinctions matter to us because when I share what that wampum means, I think it'll become clear. Then in oh, advanced screen, in Jan on January 8th of 2019, Mississauga of the Credit First Nations changed their name legally. Uh, their name previously had 
um, the word new in it. And they removed the word new. The word new is actually a, a word I talk about regularly in my classrooms and in different spaces. And the reason is, is because it wasn't the new credit. It was the credit. When, when the word new is added in front of, an, of a, a name, it is recentering the original space, which mostly are located in the European context. This we can think of when we think of New York. Where is York? New Jersey, where is Jersey? New Amsterdam, where is Amsterdam? New Hampshire, where is Hampshire? You see what I'm saying? So the use of the word new in their name made it so that it was a, a reclaiming of the, the newness. Indigenous people, we ain't new to this space. So the use of the word new was removed from their name. Secondly, I had a beautiful colleague who has now moved to McGill University named Dr. Jan Alain Tremblay. And Dr. Alain Tremblay is a Huron Wendat person. And in the original uh, land acknowledgement, we had just acknowledged the Wendat. However, under his assertion and his identity, uh, we included the word Huron. Now, this land acknowledgement got a lot of challenge. The reason was the same sentence, the area known as Sakaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Métis. The reason why the Métis were included was we had some senior scholars who were Métis scholars and asserted that they would like it there. After many conversations and what we decided was a Métis only space, we asked the Métis faculty and community members to discuss this. And it was decided, you'll see in the next one, it's been moved. Oh, this is a little bit about the uh, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Uh, their territory is somewhere down in here uh, where their reserve is. But this is a, a map of the tracts and the uh, treaties that were important to their identity. You can see right here in this orange spot, this is the Toronto Purchase. And um, it was from 1805. It has been rediscussed and reissued in 2010. Uh, part of the Toronto Purchase that has never been addressed is this part here, also known as the Toronto Islands. Um, and then this is the Between the Lake Purchase where they are currently. Uh, over here, we have the Ruse Track Claim. This Ruse Track Claim is a still unsettled land claim. Uh, for understanding an identity. Now, if you look at the Rouge, the Rouge Track claim, you may notice that right around where my pointer is, is going to be the new Markham campus. So this has been a conversation as well with the Mississaugas about uh, York's relationship to these areas known as Takaranto and now Markham. So, after many conversations, um, I'm gonna show you our new one. Oh, hold on, I lie. I also want to show you the use of one word here. I forgot to highlight, Ooh, I can't highlight, is the word and. We acknowledge the current treaty holders and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Now this was intentional. However, many of the indigenous colleagues didn't want that word and. Uh, because it, for a lot of readers, 
they didn't realize what the and meant. So when we talk about who are the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations are yes. But the other side of the treaty party is the Canadian government, which means that this is part of that relationship, that treaty relationship. We are all treaty people. What's your responsibilities, right? But it was felt that that was not understood deep enough. And so we removed the word and, as you can see in the next one. So you see, this is a new iteration. Uh, Emma read the more recent lines, what we call the COVID lines, which start with, you know, since we are not all situated in the same place, the virtual, that you take responsibility to learn where you are. Um, but this is the one that is used on campus. And we acknowledge the multiple campuses, of course, because both Glendon and Keel are located within the Toronto Purchase. Um, you can see the removal of the word Métis, and we recognize that it is now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. When we talk about an international city, as Toronto likes to talk about, I also try to remind people that it's international, because this is a space where prob there's probably somebody in this city from each Indigenous nation that is known in the geopolitical nation state of Canada, right? So it is important when we talk about the international breadth that Toronto has, are we also acknowledging the internations of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people here? People from in Indigenous people, First Nations people from Stolo territory are here, and they are, they are guests in this territory. Mi'kmaq people, Maliseet people, Passamaquoddy, uh, Cree, Soto are here. And so we need to acknowledge that it is now home to many different First Nations people and communities. Um, we again acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and that these are treaty relationships. So the Mississaugas are the ones who are hosting us. Um, the caretake, caretaking of this territory has been shared. It's shared because of the where it is located between those rivers that are now called the Credit and the Dawn and the many, many rivers that Toronto has decided uh, to bury and hide, uh, hiding the landscape of this traditional territory, trying to also hide the indigeneity of it. Okay, so this is how we got a land acknowledgement here. This land acknowledgement is current as of about, uh, just before the pandemic hit. We as an Indigenous community have not revisited it, but I also know that it is, it, we, we have felt pretty comfortable with this one for the time being. So I always say, don't set the land acknowledgement in stone. Know that you may have to reprint and have stickers. Uh, true story, the first time that we uh, printed the York Indigenous frame or the Indigenous framework for York University, uh, we had Mississauga's old name on it, and I refused to re uh, give them out anymore until we printed stickers and wrote over top the land acknowledgement again so that it was correct. And if we still had any of the original ones, I would print stickers to redo it because these are iterative. As we learn, we do better. Okay, so we say that last line, the territory is subject to the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lake region. 
When we talk about the Great Lake regions, we are actually talking about anywhere that the Great Lakes drain or the Great Lake watershed. I have a map, but I decided not to put it in. I wanted you to look at the wampum. So this wampum uh, is, was, in it, from a Haudenosaunee perspective, was brought to us when the great peacemaker of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy brought us into council for the first time. We are coming up to an event in less than three weeks uh, that is very important to the Haudenosaunee, the, the eclipse. That's a whole long story, but the eclipse is one of those moments in our Confederation story that is so important. And as you might know, the last time that the eclipse was in a space of totality in this area was August 30th of 1142 or April, oh, I forgot the date, of 909. So the Confederacy is dated either to 909 or 1142. And the great peacemaker brought us into the Confederacy and gave us this teaching about the area we live in. It is said that the dish is both a ceremonial bowl that we eat from, not eat out of, we eat from, serve ourselves from, and that Great Lakes watershed. In the bowl is said to be beaver tail. Now, beaver tail is a muscle-rich meat, meaning that it is not something that you quit, <clears throat> sorry, that you cook quickly. I always say any food for any community gathering, no matter indigenous or not, ceremonial food is never an unseasoned white chicken breast. It is always something that takes a long time with a lot of intention and care to prepare. And that's what we're serving in the Great Lake watershed as well as in the ceremonial bowl. Beaver tail, a beaver uses its tail to navigate through the water, to uh, communicate danger by slapping its tail on the water with, to other beavers, and it uses it to cob the inside of its dam. It is a tool. It is a very versatile, important understanding. And in that, that tail would be stewed. It would have to be cooked until it fell apart, put into the dish and served with one spoon. Now, the dish we are said has three teachings or three teachings that I like to share. There's probably a billion teachings because wampum is not my, uh, you know, singular knowledge production, but the three teachings that resonate with me, I've, I've heard these teachings from many different knowledge keepers. I acknowledge Rick Hill, a Tuscaroran knowledge keeper, uh, Adam, Alan, Alan Corbier, my colleague in history, who is an Anishinaabe man from a Jing First Nation, uh, my own uh, uncle, uh, Dr. Henry Lickers, who is my my mom's brother, but is an elder knowledge keeper who works out of Akasasni. Um, Susan Hill's book, The Dirt We Are Made Of. There's lots of different places these teachings are held. Uh, Cedric, Shrek, Weldrick, different places. But the teachings that I love, the three teachings on the dish are don't take more than your share. When we talk about not taking more than our share, it's not that we all have the same share. We don't. When we look at not taking more than our share, because we're talking about beaver tail, we'll talk about it as food. If we're at a home a gathering in a community and we look around this beautiful commun community we belong to, we will see people who are maybe pregnant and carrying new life or we will see people who are in their senior years. We may see little people who are running around full of life and energy as they learn to walk and talk. And I am the parent, uh, the Easta of a 13 year old. When we look at the community, 
if we gave everybody the exact same share of food, what would happen? Would that little toddler eat the same amount as my 13 year old? Is that an is that their equitable share? No, I'm willing to bet that if we gave everybody the same portion, my 13 my the 13 year old will be going around asking everybody if they can eat their leftovers, right? That's just what happens in my house. You know, it used to be when I when my children were little, I would eat their leftovers. I put less on my plate and eat their leftovers, right? Now it's the other way around. They eat my leftovers. And this is equitable because we have different needs. We do not access the same spaces with the same needs. So when we talk about the dish, it's not talking about equality. It's talking about equity. We are taught the second teaching. Make sure there's enough for everybody else. There are going to be times when it's not plentiful when there's not enough for everybody to have their share but that's when we take responsibility to make sure if my share is a little bit more I may take a little less to make sure that everybody gets some and that's how we make sure a community is healthy we also need to recognize the third teaching don't steal or foul the dish care for the dish as I said earlier where our descendants greatest hope if we damage this earth any more than we have what are they going to live for it is our responsibility to care for this earth now that spoon it would take me a long time to explain to you why the peacemaker came and why he's called the peacemaker but let's say we needed support in our peace the Horoshone as we came into Confederacy, we buried our weapons of war. You might have heard the, the that saying, bury, bury the hatchet. Well, that's coming from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy's uh, peace story, in which, as we came into Confederacy, we made an agreement not to bring weapons into our relationships. And so the spoon is there to remind us of peace. And so that is the area we live in. We're taking no more than our share, but we're making sure everyone in the community has some. And we're taking care of this earth and we do it without harming each other. That's the commitment you say when you read the land acknowledgement and acknowledge that it's governed by the dish with one spoon. This is the area we live in. And it's our responsibility to actually know these teachings. And so one of the things I do is I regularly talk about this because when we don't, when we just read it in the land acknowledgement, it becomes very much a checkbox. Hopefully when you hear it now again, in a land acknowledgement, those three teachings on the dish and that spoon teaching will come back to you and it will actually mean more to you because we are in relationship, indigenous and non-indigenous people. And this is the relationship I recognize. This is called the Gasvento or the two row wampum. Now the two row wampum is from 1613. It is a contemporary belt. And I always joke, this is the belt that I wanna see every non-indigenous person picking up appropriating is you know I always am like are people people have won somebody somebody in my PhD one of my professors told me I should put away my wampums because they're going to try to appropriate this belt and my response was like actually that's your job you're supposed to take this belt up and make sure you understand it because this belt is the first treaty belt between the Horoshone and settlers who have joined us and it said that this is our resistance to colonization and our response to it. Many times when this belt is recited, the first two lines seem to be forgotten, which is long story why I don't believe in uh, reconciliation because there is nothing to return to. We need to reimagine our relationships. But the first two lines of this belt are you say 
let's we'll be like father and son. We say let's stand as brothers. Then the part that most people know, as long as the river flows, as long as the grass grows, as long as the sun rises, we will travel down the river of life together, each in our own vessels, not interfering, but separated by peace, friendship, and mutual respect. So I've been told and taught that these purple bands represent us traveling down that river together, each in our own vessels. Ongwe Ongwe or indigenous understandings, knowledges, worldviews, politics, governance, ways of life, gender philosophies, all of it in our vessel. Over here in the other, not other purple band are those of those who've come to join us, but we're separated and held together by peace, friendship, and mutual respect. Let me define peace. Peace is not just not killing somebody. That's not peaceful living. I'm willing to bet we've all been in a circumstance in our lives with somebody we care about, someone we're in relationship with, somebody in our family, some our roommates, somebody in your life who you're struggling with and you're not at peace with. You may love them. You may care for them. You may have a relationship, but something's happened. And there's not peace. You get a feeling in the pit of your stomach that makes it so maybe I don't want to go home or you're nervous around them. Something. You're not killing each other, but you're not living in peace. So you need to work with the friendship. Friendship is not just the person who you're going to go and have tea with. I'm going to say Emma's my friend because Emma's had quite a few hard call outs, right? You know, moments in time where, where I've been like, you're doing good work. But my our friendship needs you to understand this. It's real friendship is when we can call out and call in and work through the hard stuff. That's when you know you have a real, real friend, right? Mutual respect comes from knowing each other, knowing in depth what you think who you are, what you bring to the table. It's not just, I respect all living things. Yes, of course we respect all living things, but mutual respect means that we see and understand each other. And this is the wampum that we are supposed to be living together as Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. That peace, that friendship, that mutual respect. And so when I think of Gaswenta, I think of it's a responsibility for us all to share, which takes us to who are you in relationship? And I always, when I talk about the first question, um, I've changed how I talk about it because in Indigenous communities, it's very, very common for us to ask where you're from, but in a lot of Euro white Canadian context, when people say, where are you from? They're actually kind of telling you you don't belong, which can be harmful and hurtful. For us, when we say, where are you from? Can you acknowledge your history of being here? We may be trying to figure out, you know, how we are in relation to each other. I'm doing a quick, Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, oh, I see that, you know, I'm looking in the, the participants list and sorry, Jake, you're getting called out. So if I ask Jake where Jake's from, I know Jake would actually be able to answer and talk to me about who Jake is. Mostly because Jake and I have had these conversations. So I did a quick check and you were the first letter I came up against. And, you know, how are you here? Why are you here? Some people will have, to, will, will talk about the fact that they are the descendants of colonizers. Some people may, you know, say my family did not choose to come here. We were forced to come here through enslavement. Some people will say my family or I, I came here because my where where 
where I identify from on this beautiful earth is not safe for me. And it is not that you don't belong here. Our teachings, that Caswenta, you belong here. But come into the relationship with peace, friendship, and mutual respect. Let's get to, you know, understand. So when you do a land acknowledgement, can you acknowledge your history of being here? As Emma said, she's an Italian, uh, first-generation Italian person. And that's important to her. Because it made Emma who she is. Does it mean she doesn't belong here? No. It just means that we have different relationships to this space. What's your political commitment to peace, friendship, and mutual respect? Emma also talked about, you know, taking leadership from Indigenous people and working to dismantle the taken for granted assumptions, I think that's what you said, of what Canada is or the geopolitical nation state of Canada. And please, 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 please do not say that your political commitments is that you have Indigenous friends. If you say my Indigenous friend Ruth, believe me, we are no longer friends, right? Uh, if if that's if you are using me as an excuse to say that your com commit your complete political commitment, it's superficial. I need it from you. You can say, you know, I learned from my indigenous friend Ruth, as I cited other people. But it's not about using Indigenous or any racialized person to say that you can continue being politically uncommitted. And then, how are you committed to unrelearning? Please know that it's a lifelong process. There is no instant here. And that we will be, you know, doing this work for a very long time. And uh, hopefully, as we learn, re, un, learn, we'll work together. Now, I promised to give a little bit of resources because resources are always good. Uh, this first image is to, uh, Beyond the Territorial Acknowledgements written by the brilliant uh, Chelsea Vowels. Uh, and it's from 2016, but it is amazing. Uh, she actually even talks about the Canadian Association of Universities teachers, little tiny blurbs. Down here, we have an article written by uh, a dear colleague from Osgood Law. It says he was at the Faculty of Law at Windsor, which, which he was when he wrote this. But now Je uh, Jeffrey Hewitt is at is an associate professor at Osgood. Uh, it's called Land Acknowledgement Scripting and Julius Caesar. And then here's one of my articles, What's a Guest, What's a Settler, which talks about the, re uh, the relationships that people who want to be guests can take up uh, to move from the concept of just being a settler, somebody who knew, knows whose land you're on, to actual working with communities. Oh, why is that button not working? Uh, York, Indigenous community members at York a few years ago, uh, pre-pandemic, so it's a few, it's the second land acknowledgement, um, took up the responsibility of creating a video that would help non-Indigenous people understand the land acknowledgement. So I love sharing this. Uh, you can actually even just Google York U land acknowledgement and then click on the video link. It's the first one. I think the YouTube photo is of Amy. Uh, so these are three of the wonderful people that uh, were part of the video. As I said earlier, uh, Amy Darjolet was our knowledge keeper uh, here at York uh, for a few years. And she, uh Randy Pinawanaquit is the coordinator or the director of Indigenous Student Services. These are older titles, but Randy and Amy were part of the people who um, first were uh, first draft of the land acknowledgement. In our own little Indigenous community here at York, we call uh, Amy Hall Little Amy and Amy Darjale 
Big Amy because Big Amy has big shoes to fill. Um, so I'm just going to open us up to questions. Did I go? I didn't go fast enough, did I? Sorry. Thank you so much, Ruth, for your insightful talk. We are so grateful that you joined us here today. We have a few questions from the audience. One that is waiting, um, it's from Mazine. And Mazine has asked whether it's acceptable to get a replica of the wampum belt that you showed in your presentation to frame on a wall or put in an office. Which one are they wanting to know about, I wonder? Hmm. So yes, you can buy replicas. I actually have quite a few replicas that I carry when I do in-person teachings. I bring them out and I put them out on a blanket and I talk through them. Um, and part of wampum belt is that we, what we do is we call, or what we call polishing the wampum. And it's about acknowledging and reciting those stories or what I've just shared with you, explaining some of the teachings. There are many places where uh, I have seen framed wampums and it doesn't, these are replicas. So it's not like you're holding the living document. It is a responsibility to know the teachings if you are going to display it. Uh, I buy all of my replicas. Mine are made out of glass beads and not quahog shells. So there's a long, in one of my articles, I explain what wampum is actually made out of, but they would have been made out of shell beads um, that were uh, from the quahog. Uh, and what happens is they would have been broken and the shells are purple and white. So the, the beads would have been sanded, shaped, had a hole born through them and then loomed onto the belt. And uh, the beads are very expensive because they're made out of shell and you're trying to make shell uniform in size. It's a trick. Um, I've never made a wampum bead, but I had one of my grandmothers uh, do a eight day or eight hour workshop. And she was very proud of the two beads she was able to make. And she got to have a Dremel and polishers and all the other things. So when we are looking at wampum, know that a, a shell wampum belt is incredibly expensive but in a lot more easy to purchase belts are available. Uh, there are quite a few places you can get them. Uh, Ken Miracle or the Wampum Maker uh, makes them on Six Nations. I've bought quite a few belts for him as well as the, um, oh, what's it called? It's out of the Oshwegan Library. There's a project outside out of the Oshwegan Library on Six Nations Reserve near Brantford that also has wampum. So they can be they can be purchased and and framed. Yes, I've seen it before. I would just ensure that you have some under like be able to share those teachings because sharing the teachings are actually really important. So especially if it's a, a gasventa or a two row. Perfect. Thank you, Ruth. We have another question from the audience, and this is from Zoe M, who yep. asked is if it's acceptable um, to share a personal reflection with the land acknowledgement. Of course it is, because that's part of what we're trying to do is those three questions I asked. Um, hold on, I'm trying to go back to them. How come I can't go back to my questions? Because I'm still sharing, but I can't seem to. Uh, or you could stop screen share and then it, I'm trying to go back. Here okay. We go. okay. <laughs> so, you know, explaining who you are when you read the land acknowledgement uh, and your political commitment, those are things that are totally acceptable and make it so it's not just you standing there reading a script. Now, it is important to acknowledge that when you do read the land acknowledgement, even if it is a script, that Remember when I asked it to be recognized that it says care taken, not care take or taken care of by? Indigenous people 
predominantly have written these institutional land acknowledgements. They are emotional labor that we do. So to say, I'm not going to read a land acknowledgement because they're tokenistic has just set down work that Indigenous people have put into creating those documents. And it's not easy. It's exhausting as an Indigenous person to do that work. So, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Jake Pine, who has asked, um, if the recent change to the York land acknowledgement wording was in response to the controversy surrounding the group calling themselves the Eastern Métis. So what was happening, and this is why we did a Métis only space uh, for some of our Métis colleagues to have these conversations. Um, as a First Nations individual, uh, it is very challenging for me to assert over top of Métis sovereignty and Métis identity. So um, it is part of the controversy that has been surrounding conversations of where are historic Métis homelands. So yes, Jake. And, you know, I am a First Nations woman and uh, there has been a lot of questions around the assertion, especially with, you know, um, legislation that is trying to create space for Métis communities to assert uh, land claim, especially in Ontario. Uh, Métis land claim in, you know, Manitoba is a Métis land claim in Manitoba. It makes sense, right? That the the prairies are are the historic homelands um and so yes i hope that answers that perfect thank you ruth we have a question from somebody who would rather be anonymous and they've asked if whether you can tell us a bit more about balancing self introduction and land acknowledgement i think emma did a really uh good way of that um there are many people I think that you can look for role modeling of. Um, people that come to mind are Dr. Celia Hegg Brown and how she does it when she acknowledges the land. Um, it's not always about sharing colonial history or it's about taking responsibility. Um, and sharing and articulating um a commitment to the land acknowledgement did i answer that emma because i can't i can't see it so i can't think it yes yes and okay. yeah, definitely yes yes so anthony howell has asked um the land acknowledgement that we follow in peel asks us to acknowledge or moves us to take action many people just move past the statement and i feel that this is the most important aspect of the land acknowledgement what are some actions you can share with us that help honor the land as well as move Indigenous teachings forward in education? Excellent question, Anthony. So I actually teach a master's level social work class and the final assignment of my students uh, need to, to do is a solidarity statement um, where they look at who are they in relation to the land acknowledgement and what are their personal commitments, political commitments? Now, these are for social workers. So there's lots of fun things you can pull apart because of the over engagement, nice word, of social workers in Indigenous people's lives. But this, like some people, they may not uh, be currently active in in, in building relationship or solidarity actions. So maybe they can find ways to connect with community or listen and learn. And if you are just starting to learn, maybe your commitment is I am committing to reading an, a, a, a book by an indigenous author once a month, listening to a podcast, watching an indigenous produced uh, piece of media, be it film or a TV series, 
uh, learning, learning. But making sure what you're learning is coming from Indigenous peoples, right? And then also understanding that we're not monolithic. So, you know, learning across the, the geopolitical nation state of Canada is important. Learning about the people that are in the territory you're in, reading the treaty, go and find the treaty. There's act, you can actually read the, the, the text of the treaty. And if you can't understand it, and it's in, you know, a language that you can read, think about what it would have been when it was signed, right? Have you read the treaty of the territory you're in? And I've even read the Toronto Purchase. It's still written in, you know, language that I question. So how can we do those sorts of things? Those sorts of commitments are really important. And I agree with you. You know, taking action is one of the most important parts. And I'm sad that people, you know, skip it. Probably because they're uncomfortable with the lack of action they're taking. And, you know, maybe sometimes it's, Helpful to share some of the things as you've asked. What can I do? And yeah, yeah, we do need people who are willing to stand beside us when there's a call to action. But when those people come, we need to make sure that they have, they're have they coming in a respectful way that de doesn't is not about centering themselves. You know, um, my youngest child was from the winter we danced. Uh, they were born, actually their birthday's on Saturday. Um, and, and they'll be 11. So 11 years ago right now, I don't know more, was very, very much in people's, uh, in people's consciousness. And a lot of people made commitments. Are they still adhering to those commitments? I am. I've got an 11 year old. Sorry, that's <laughs> any other questions? No, there are no more from the audience. Okay, so thank you so much, Professor Green. Thank you so much. We are honored to have heard you speak today. I agree. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Green, for that presentation. And Emma, thank you also for joining us today. You're both welcome to now turn off your video. Um, for those of you who would like to share today's session with family and friends, it will be posted to our YouTube page at youtube.com slash alumni. Maybe we can put a link in the chat there. You can also watch past lectures that you may have missed. And join us on Wednesday, April 10th at 12 p.m. for Meritocracy. Is it worth the price and how do we continue to live with it? With Shulik School of Business instructor Keshav Krishnamurti. To register for that event and learn more about up upcoming sessions, visit yourq.ca slash alumni and friends. Thank you and be well.